When we were young, life was a game and every adventure. We laughed and we fought and sometimes we cried. We were sometimes punished too. But there was an enchantment and a magic and the world was full of limitless possibilities. But for Michael, it is different. For Michael, everything is strangely difficult. For Michael is a psychotic child who is suffering from a gross mental disturbance. Like Ivan, he comes every day of the week to this nursery. Here, for a few hours, trained people will try and help these children while their parents can discuss their own problems with another psychiatric worker. Come on, Susan, hang up your coat. Hang up your coat, darling. Put it on the peg. That's right. Susan trying to hang up her coat. That's something she's learned to do. Very simple, yes. perhaps, but it was only a little while ago that the doctor's verdict on Susan was hopeless. Ah, to know what Michael's thinking, so remote in his secret world. And Joan, little Joan eating chalk. It doesn't seem to matter to her, she's so far away. Like Carol, banging, mindless in a place of fantasy she cannot tell us about. It is a world full of confusion, where nothing seems to make sense. For Michael, though, there is a certain release and contentment in the steady rhythm of running up and down. Like Joan on her rocking horse, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Somehow it is very soothing. But always, it is a world of their own. There is no awareness of those around them. It is a world without human contact. For the psychotherapist, it is a job needing great patience. For somehow she must try and make contact with the children. This is the important thing. No matter how small, no matter how unorthodox the way, to try and get a response from the children is the beginning of it all. You want to puff puff? You want to puff puff? I'm not really giving Ivan is nine now, and he cannot talk. But he can hum. He sometimes hums the basic melody of a Beethoven symphony. Ivan is a sensitive child in the way he handles things, in the way he hates unpleasant sounds as much as he loves pleasant ones. Poor Ivan, you look so worried. And how can you tell them to stop? Joan may not be able to talk either, but she knows when somebody likes her. It's then she feels secure and happy. For these children are very affectionate and above all need affection. The psychotherapist knows, too, that you can have as much knowledge of psychology and of these children as you like, but if you don't love them, you might as well abandon any hope of helping them.
Susan knows how to drive her car now. She is learning how to use things. But for Carol, for her, this is all as yet impossible. For Carol is only occasionally making contact with things around her. But then, how would you have found it, Susan, outside, playing with children who find it all so easy? Would you have retreated, like Carol, into a shell? It all takes so long to learn things, and when Joan experiments with new ways of riding her rocking horse, it progress. Remember when he first was silent and surly he was. He never laughed, for Jeremy lived with a nightmare. His mother was a sick woman, and two years ago he was with her when she killed herself. Now, although Jeremy may not be a normal child, he is at least a happy child. Every so often, Susan is given a standard intelligence test. This helps to give some ideas to if she's improving or not. How often, at moments like this, there seems so little difference between Susan and a normal child. How surprising, too, are the differences in ability between each of them. A puzzle for Michael is as easy as that. Yet Michael cannot speak a word, only make a shrill, shrieking sound. But for Susan, Susan who can talk more than anybody, she just doesn't seem to make any sense of it at all. And Jeremy? Well, Jeremy too has his way of approaching things. And although we may be reluctant to accept it, it is being allowed to give vent to his feelings that has helped him along this far. Yes, how different they all are. Ivan blowing bubbles so carefully, so delicately, and watching with a passive fascination as they sink to the ground. Jeremy, aggressive and impetuous, seeing how many he can burst before they hit the floor. and then we all fall down. And this game always seems to end like that. But just for a moment, we were doing things together, enjoying ourselves. And there was a contact between us, that was what mattered. Like learning to share things and doing things with each other. It wasn't always like that with Joan. At one time there would have been tears and tantrums and a sort of terror at losing her old rocking horse. <coughs> Supposing Susan had been born 30 years ago and her parents had been poor, what sort of treatment would there have been for her then? Now we have a national health service. 
It still has many shortcomings, but with so much new knowledge and so many new methods, perhaps we will really be able to help. And in this room is a part of the whole process. Learning to understand the children and their ways, and helping them to learn, at least with their handicap, how to be happy. Perhaps Jeremy will never be a normal child. Perhaps none of these children will, although many like them do become well. But for Carol in her isolation, and Joan and her rocking horse, for Ivan humming his Beethoven, and Susan washing her little pig, Jeremy planning his next bit of mischief, and Michael, beautiful Michael, who cannot talk. How will it be for them outside the security of this room? Will they find people who have time for them and who care? we have a consultant psychiatrist who is also the medical director of the Marlborough Day Hospital in London. I think that, uh, Doctor, you're also an editor, aren't you? Yes, I'm the editor of the International Journal of Social Psychiatry. Tell me, what does a day hospital mean? A day hospital is a place of treatment for <coughs> patients suffering from nervous and mental diseases who don't come for a whole week, but for part of the week, either for the day, for the night, or for the weekend. This is really part of a great revolution which started in the mental health services, which started here in Great Britain and is spreading now all over the world. We have learned to treat the patient not just as a mysterious animal, but as a human being who can be understood. And if you understand somebody, then you don't need to be frightened of him, and then you can treat him in the community, and you don't need to lock him up. What is the hospital's connection with children? We believe in social psychiatry. By social psychiatry, we understand that we treat the total setup. We might treat the mother-in-law, or the boss of the factory, the foreman. But in any case, we treat the total family. We've done that for 15 years. And the Marlborough Day Hospital was the first in this field. There are now over 70 day hospitals. Now, by treating the total family, we've come to the conclusion that mothers suffer a lot, especially if they have to look after, 24 hours, look after children who are very, very sick. I really wonder, you see, why we don't give a VC, you know, to those mothers. Because they are heroic not only once, but for 24 hours every day. And therefore we thought that it might be helpful for all the mothers and the children if we took the children in for the day to relieve that tremendous strain. And then it is obviously very helpful because the mothers don't need to part from the children, send them away to institutions. I see. What are the causes and the treatment for these children? We saw one of the helpers blowing smoke into a child's mouth. Yeah, the causes really are not quite known. You see, we are still experimenting. But one thing we do know, that all these children have put a very thick Chinese wall around them. And the whole aim of the treatment is to penetrate that wall. First, the aim is to make contact with one person, with a specialist. Then, uh, to get them to make contact with other children. And in the end, to make contact with reality. And obviously, it is necessary to get the parents to cooperate to relieve their worry, to get them to talk to somebody, to the psychiatric social worker or another member of the staff, 
and to get them to understand their children and the whole situation. That obviously helps. So you've really got to make contact and then go on from there, you hope, however slowly and painfully. But some of these children surely might just be late developers. Yes, it does happen sometimes. And <coughs> I think it's important to know that to be a late developer, I was myself a late developer, is a very good thing, very much better than if you are too forward. You see, it's very difficult for a horse to be always in the front. You see, the responsibility is too great in many of those to break down. But to be a late developer is not bad, because you do catch up with the right treatment. But the thing, I suppose, is not to worry the child. That's right. And the parents shouldn't worry. That's very important. What are the prospects for those children that we have seen just now in the film? Before, we considered them completely hopeless. But now we can say the results are very much better than expected. Already two children have gone to normal schools, two others are going very soon, one other has gone to special school. So five, five have improved greatly and three haven't improved so far. So the results are very much better than we ever expected. And we do hope for the progress and more research we might be able to get still better results. Do you get good cooperation from the parents? Yes, very excellent cooperation. How many children have you got in the school now? We have seven, seven children at the moment. Do you keep to that number or would you keep About, more? yes, we wouldn't like to have more than eight. You see that? Because too many, you see, it wouldn't work. They do must get very, very special individual treatment. I see. Thank you very much, Dr. Well. Thank you. It's nice to know that there is so much hope after all. That's the end of Family Affairs for today, so goodbye. <laughs>